Welcome everybody to the New Flesh podcast. It's another side boob cinema. It's a very special edition side boob cinema. We are here. We are joined by our friends uh, from over the pond from the Hey You Guys podcast. How is everyone? Good. Very good. Thank you. And thank you so much for having us. This is uh, this is awesome. Very exciting as well. Our first crossover podcast. This feels you know it's like Marvel and DC almost. Same with us. <laughs> Unbelievable. First crossover. Well. Uh- can we be Marvel at that point? Because I know more Marvel than DC, but uh, no, really, uh, really looking forward to this one. Really, uh, as as we've already alluded to, it's been months in the making. It's been uh, it's been one I've been looking forward to doing. So, well, the the films we're doing today are uh, Weekend at Bernie's one and two. I had heaps of fun uh, what rewatching these ones. I hope you guys did too. Oh well, oh, I mean, uh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> I mean, I, just to be clear. And like you guys, I mean, you all seem to have a long history with these films. I've literally just watched them over the last few days for the first time. And man, to say I have very differing views of the two films would be a massive understatement. <laughs> so, like, and the whole thing, like coming into it, it's like, I don't know how I knew so little about Weekend at Bernie's. It's like, you know, one of those films, it feels like it totally should have been on my radar. But instead, mm. it's, it's like, I didn't know who was in it. I didn't really know what the tone was. All I knew was what doing a weekend at Bernie's is. Mm. That that's it. I, I say right. that like I've done it in the past. <laughs> Just to be clear, I haven't. I've never done a, a weekend at Bernie's. But Liam, I think you've you've hit on something which which maybe we'll get into a bit later. Uh, uh, is uh, these movie these movies are iconic and 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 like some of the other movies we cover and that you guys cover. I feel that some of the iconic elements have totally overshadowed the actual movie itself. You know, like like the hundred percent. Like think about it, like that baby blue jacket, the Lennon sunnies, the smirk. But the it's the premise. The premise is quite famous. And well, it's and- yeah, but it's quite it's quite funny because you think of you think of these two films and as you just said, the premise which you get from number one. But a lot of the things you remember. Is from number two. Yeah, it's so true. <laughs> like, yeah, like it's if I'm so thinking true. of Weekend the Bernies, I'm thinking of him dancing and things like that when he was on his own. That's all number two. The voodoo curse, which these two films are completely different. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, they yeah, really are. Said, you, you think doing a Weekend of Bernies, it's uh, as Liam has already said, he's probably kidnapped the corpse and done this over <laughs> the weekend. But have you guys? Have you guys not? I mean, if you've never been there, for, like, how many times have I been like, oh, dude, we've got to get into Tyler's party. And they're like, I know, but they'll only let us into, if, if Steve is with us and Steve is dead. I'm like, oh, okay, dude, I've got a plan. I've got a plan. I haven't seen the movie, but I've heard about this movie. We can totally get it. You know? <laughs> well, before we take a deep dive on this uh, on this film, maybe, John, you yes. can hit us with a bit of the a table. You yep. set the table. I'll set the table. Okay. Okay. Strap yourselves in. Weekend at Bernie's. Here we go. So... Richard and Larry, played by Jonathan Silverman and Andrew McCarthy, are two level, low-level schlubs who work at a New York insurance firm. Richard lives with his parents and Larry lives in a small roach-infested apartment. One burning hot weekend in the city, they work overtime and discover a massive financial oversight. The books are out $2 million. Basically, someone's trying to defraud the company. They excitedly take the news to their boss, Bernie Lomax, a Trumpian figure with a taste for fast cars and faster women. Bernie offers to go over the case in more detail over the Labor Day weekend, so he invites the boys to his plush house in the Hamptons. Turns out that Bernie is the one actually trying to screw the company. He meets with his mobster associates and asks that they kill Richard and Larry. Bernie's going to tie up the loose ends by writing a murder-suicide note and planning some money to uh, take care of uh, Richard and Larry. The mobsters agree to sick their best man, Paulie, on the case, and the head of the family, Vito, decides to kill Bernie, uh, also because Bernie is nailing his girlfriend, Tina. Meanwhile, Richard has a disastrous date uh, with, that's Jonathan Silverman, has a disastrous date with Gwen from work, uh, inter, an inter, summer intern. Uh, he gets caught out in a lie about living with his parents. Hitman Paulie arrives on the island in the Hamptons, surprising Bernie, and Paulie gives him a hot dose of heroin. Richard and Larry finally arrive themselves and head up to Bernie's beach house and discover that Bernie is dead. The pair want to do the right thing, but Bernie is a party magnet with something always getting in the way of them calling the authorities. Turns out intern Gwen is also a Hamptonite. Richard apologizes to Gwen and they're back to square one as long as he doesn't lie to her anymore. The boys discover Bernie's plan to have them killed by a recording and they also find the evidence of the frame up, the money and the note. Paulie, the hitman, convinced that he's he's blown the gig, returns again and again to finish the job. At the same time, Richard and Larry try to escape the island. 
forced to return to Bernie's mansion. Gwen also, uh, Gwen disguise, uh, the boys, uh, uh, that is the boys return to Bernie's mansion. Gwen finally discovers the truth about Bernie. Paulie arrives to kill everyone. Larry and Bernie uh, defeat Paulie. Richard and Larry win the day. What did we make of weekend at Bernie's? Well, first off, it, you know, when you're reading that, I'm I, like, I'm questioning it in my head. I was like, this is a comedy, right? Because <laughs> 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 some pretty, there's some pretty dark shit in this film. The comedy of errors is the hitman uh, consistently killing a dead person. <laughs> yes, yes. Like over and over, he's killing a dead person. Like, one of my favorite, actually, that's one of my favorite um, bits in the movie. Because uh, that, that one of the jokes, I guess, is that guy losing his composure and <laughs> comes. So he rolls back, and then. Um, uh, Bernie jumps down, like falls down off the off the the balcony, and the guy's like resting with him, and he's and and he the the the, the performance and the sound from the hitman's just great. He says says like, "I got you, I got you, you <laughs> son of a bitch, I got you," and, and he's like strangling a dead guy, and, and Bernie's doing that sort of hapless, um, like pathetic, like almost half fighting with him, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's, I think it's one of the underrated aspects of this film. Is the the physical comedy? Is yes. it uh, Terry Kaiser as Bernie Lomax? Like he's so good in this film. It's it's one of those ones easy to kind of write off. Oh, he's just playing a dead guy. The kind of the same way you would say, oh, it's easy for Arnie to play, say, the Terminator because he's not doing anything. But I feel like you've got to have a certain skill skill set to pull that off. That whole like you know you're, you're pretending to be dead, but at the same time you can't quite act dead. You've got to kind of fall into certain positions while still maintaining the element that you're not in control of yourself. I, I, don't know, I thought he was really good. In this. Well, Terry, but Terry Kaiser, if you look at his his uh, sort of career, apparently he he headed up some you know pretty good acting school, and that makes perfect sense. I just knew that he was going to be like um Henry Winkler from Barry, you know, like or, yeah, or yeah. um like or like Jeffrey Tambor or someone. So one of these like LA guys who is like really serious and he's also Bernie. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And sadly for him, he's he's mostly Bernie. Can you imagine though him getting the script for this and going, well, I'm dead at the beginning of the film, but I'm through it all. Like just Imagine well, no, that, that, that's very much the script for the second film, isn't it? At least he gets half he has an hour. a bit to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, he does get half an hour. You're right. I, I do apologize. I'm confusing the two films again. I'm not sure if it's much better for him because Bernie's just the worst. I mean, he's so incompetent. It's unbel- like it's like he wants to get killed or wants to get caught. I mean, he's talking about murdering them in like busy restaurants. He's what is this this mob boss guy who's clearly pretty serious business. You know, he's not only fucking his wife, but he's like cavorting with her outside of the place that they were all eating. I'm like, dude, man, it's like you want to get killed, of course, which happens very soon. But you can't, you can't feel for our hapless heroes either, because Andrew McCarthy is a scumbag in this film and in number two. Absolute scumbag. <laughs> he is a complete scumbag. Oh my god! I've got this weird thing with it because I'm quite new to the world of Andrew McCarthy, um, and I, I kind of. He's also, I think he benefits from being the, uh, maybe the nicest of a bunch of truly horrendous characters in St. Elmo's Fire. I watched that not too long ago. And that film, the main thing that stands out to me in that film is that everyone's a bellend. But I'm like, he's kind of the most likable of an an otherwise horrendous cast. And in this, I'm like, there's got to be something to him because he is a terrible person, but I'm still kind of rooting for him. And I'm like, you know, and I'm like, why is why wasn't Andrew McCarthy like a bigger star? I'm like, I'm watching this. And I'm almost like, you know, he's got those connections with John Hughes from Pretty in Pink. And I feel like like he could have been Ferris Bueller in another world. Like that's, you know, when I'm watching this film, I feel like he's got that kind of vibe. And I'm telling, I'm asking myself, I'm like, oh, why didn't he have a bigger career? And then I watched Weekend of Bernie's 2. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's why. Because... <laughs> That's that's what I found. That's what I found the difference between the two movies. Like Weekend at Bernie's one, I, I loved Andrew McCarthy's character. Like he was yeah. a scumbag, but I, I thought he was one of the best parts of the film. Like he was just Absolutely. a little scumbag. But then Weekend at Bernie's two, I felt like he was oh, the worst man. thing about the movie. <laughs> yes. Like he was just too over the top, and he just he just looked weird, and it was just too yeah. much. And he was gurning all the time. That weird laugh he kept yeah. bringing in. I was like, how have they turned what, like, and as I said, I was watching these two films, like, within a couple of days of each other, and I came out of Weekend and Bernie, I was like, man, I, I like Larry so much, just despite the fact that he's a dick. 
And then I watched Weekend Bernie Sue. I was like, that is one of the most unlikable movie performances I have ever seen. Well, it's insane. I'm going to dissent. I'm going to dissent Ooh. from you people. I I loved him in number two. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was all running so smoothly. First chink in the armor here, dude. First chink in the armor. <laughs> no, I agree because I agree with what you're all saying. But but at the same time, I thought that the that the set that the the his second movie performance was a logical uh, uh, ramping of his first, um, and I can explain why. Um, oh please. It, well, no, because the the when you think about it, uh, he has um, there's no deterrent. Uh, that he's they've gotten away with so many crimes and and so in sort of a, a Dostoevsky way he's become monstrous <laughs> and uh he's he's I think in the second one he's just like you know a, a, a turned up to 11 version of the of the first movie um and I thought it was um a very bold choice for them to have him well I guess very early on he is jump like jumping on the suitcase to try and get Bernie <laughs> off in that's the, the best part of that of that second film yeah you said, you said about monstrous no more so than stuffing a man a dead body into a suitcase to take him on holiday yes I, I, I mean a big problem with this though is that there's such different movies and like you said I don't necessarily have an issue with the escalation of his character into like let's be clear like lunatic by the end of the second film mm. but because the set the second film is so much weaker than the first the first one is like yeah you can watch it as this kind of hijinks well put a dark comedy i mean it, it's weird because it, it's actually quite well disguised as a dark comedy it's it's actually something broader and more instantly likable than it really should be you know and underneath like if you like when you're reading the synopsis like god this sounds like a yargos lanthimos movie it's like this could have just been Dogtooth again. But the second film, because they kind of remove the subtle social commentary, which is underlying the film, just, there's nothing to kind of latch onto him as, a, as this likable character. It's like, you know, his actions are kind of like tonally and narratively drip. Sorry, they're kind of explainable by the social comment, commentary underpinning the movie. So like the whole gap between the rich and the rest and Richard and Larry taking these different approaches, like, okay, Richard... I'm going to work hard because if I work hard enough, I'll get what I want. Whereas Larry's like, he thinks it's bullshit. So he's like, I'm going to take any opportunity to get to the top. I'm like, oh yeah, I can kind of get on board with that. And then his subsequent actions. And because they remove all that social commentary in the second film, I'm like, oh no, just Larry's just being an absolute psycho. And of course they, they kind of upscale the hijinks unbelievably to the point where, as you already mentioned, he's stuffing a human body into a suitcase. <laughs> and one of the most nineties things ever, like you're watching this, this movie and I've, you know, Obviously, everything going on is crazy. And all I kept thinking was, how the hell did they get a dead body through security? That's I what mean, I was you know, thinking I know too. it's an internal point, but Jesus. They, uh, they said it, didn't they? It's it's uh, no customs because it is classed as Amer uh, America. So apparently, it's just easy to do it if you go in between states. Oh, apparently so. <laughs> well, okay. So you've mentioned a lot there, Liam. I think maybe we'll stick macro for a bit um, and talk about, you know, particularly the first movie, uh, yeah, yeah. And l let's talk about these big themes that you've all, you mentioned there. You mentioned, um, you know, the satire. Mentioned like what it's about. Maybe we could talk about what the hell we think it's about, or the or the genre. But the 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 basic fact is that lots of people like this movie, mm. despite all, the, mm. despite the bad press, despite the second movie, despite everything. This was a big titted hit. <laughs> this made this was like this was made for like fifteen million or something, and it made like thirty or mm. whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah. And then, and then it spawned a sequel. And like, I think you look at those numbers because we tend to focus on those old, um, those box office numbers. But also the ancillary market, the the video sales of both of these, mm -hmm. and the cable sales and everything would have been huge. So, I think this did it did it did well enough that that people are suing each other on behind the scenes, like like Ted Kotcheff and uh, the writer. Um, What's his name? Robert, whatever. Robert Klein. Klein, sorry. They're both suing, you know, someone because it made so much money. That's always a good sign. Well, it's just, it's, well, yeah, because it's just like, if we are just talking exclusively about the first one in particular, it's because the first one's really good. It's really like, and again, we come back to, to, to Larry and I think less so with um, Richard, who I actually think has a bit of a kind of uh, Ross from Friends vibe where, he, you know, on, on the surface, he's trying to do the right thing, but he really is actually a bit of a dick. But fundamentally, it's like the first film is well made. It's funny with a really likable cast of characters. And, you know, it's no surprise. I mean, Ted Kochev, you already mentioned the director. I mean, this guy's got chops. This guy directed, you know, First Blood. 
That's an mm. absolutely amazing film. Well, he, he actually directed one of Australia's greatest ever movies, which is Wake and Fright. If you if you've never seen if you've never seen Wake and Fright, you've got to see it. It it spawned the Australian film renaissance of the nineteen seventies. Well, I think you can go bigger and say, I mean, I, I I tell people it's the greatest Australian movie ever made. That's uh, that was Donald Pleasance. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So direct, you know, uh, it takes an outsider. It takes someone. I think he's from Canada. It takes an outsider to see, mm. you know, to bring something new. Uh, to um, you know, just make you see yourself in a way, and, and I think that he, you know he. Well, I watch that movie; it's too close to home. Do you know what I mean? You watch it, and you and I just get chills. I just go, "Oh my god, he's nailed! He's nailed us!" And that was from 1971, but a lot of that stuff is still true. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so yeah, Ted, Co- as you're saying, Ted Kotcheff, he's the real deal. Um, oh yeah, yeah, it really is. Well, you say that. I mean, he went from he went from that to do uh, the shooter with Dolph Lundgren, which. Uh, Hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh well. You know they can't. They, right they can't me. all be bullseyes. <laughs> <laughs> did you not? Did you not hear all this stuff about Australia? I mean, Jesus Christ! Give the guy a break. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of bad reviews, let's. Uh, I, I do want to explore some of the deeper themes here, but um, uh, I want to take Roger Ebert to task here for a second. Okay. So I think it's fair to say we've got a love-hate relationship with this guy on our podcast. <laughs> And I've got a bone to pick a with mix, this. He's a mixed bag. <laughs> I've got a bone to pick with this guy, okay? So Roger Ebert, in his uh, 1989 review of Weekend at Bernie's, criticizes the film because, quote, the comedy requires the other characters to be so stupid as not to notice Bernie is dead. <laughs> okay? So uh, my question is, uh, what if this is the point of the film? So Larry and Rich- Yeah, yeah, I yeah Larry and Rich are too innocent and dumb to be accused of Bernie's murder. Uh, Bernie himself can't be viewed a- as a victim or a- at least uh, as an audience member. We don't give him any sympathy for being killed. Um, so instead, the social criticism of the film is aimed squarely at the Hamptons crowd whose, uh, you know, their self-indulgences and self-obsessions make them uh, ob- oblivious to Bernie's situation. And, uh, and and like you said, Astro, money doesn't lie. You know, the film was successful. Uh, it-, it made a shit ton of money. And um, in the film, neighbours come and go from Bernie's house, they drink his alcohol, they borrow his boat, they mooch off him left and right. Um, and implied in all of this is that, that Bernie is one of those people and would act in, in exactly the same way. Uh, he'd be equally unaware of the, the neighbours, you know, if his neighbour had died next door, you know. So it's unlikely that the intended audience for Weekend at Bernie's um, a Chardonnay sipping elites that spend their summers in the Hamptons, you know, <laughs> or write film columns for the Chicago Sun-Times, you know. So the intended audience for this film are people that identify with Larry and Rich. Oh, 100%. Know. Well, he sort of put that, but they put the, you can hear all the interactions at the party. They're talking about book reviews and cars and plays and Harvard. And he sort of put the critics in the movie. In, mm. to, to a certain degree, like he's got something. Like if you listen to the ADR in the background and stuff, they're talking about there's these sort of posh reviewers talking about theatre and whatnot. And so, you know, I think that that, that that's very much what. We, yeah, th- this movie is a, a, a movie of the people, and it, it's one of those films like and, and the best of their kind. Like it gets to you know have its cake and eat it, as it were, because it, it, it works on both ends of the spectrum. It's like if you want to just watch it and be like. Oh, you know, they get away with this because, as you say, Richard and Larry are dumb. You can watch it at that surface level and just enjoy it for what it is. But if you want to, as you say, dig a little deeper, if you want to question why the rich and famous aren't, you know, noticing the fact that Bernie's clearly dead, it does come back to that critique on the fact of, you know, the self-absorbed nature of the rich and famous of, of the US in the 80s. So, yeah, it, you know, it, it's, it's surprising maybe that he didn't see it for what it was. Mm. But yeah, but I think a lot of people probably are happy to watch that film and wistfully kind of ignore the the social commentary that's going on below the surface and just kind of enjoy Larry and Richard's hijinks. Do you think we 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 like them because they're middle class and they have ambition and they're they're working, you know, at the beginning they're working overtime and they're trying to get ahead in this me generation. Uh, they're sort of fighting against systems. Do you think that that like is a, one of the drivers of the why of why we like them? For sure, yeah. The way the film opens with them, you know, going to work on a really hot summer's day in New York and and 
you know, they look tired, but they're still pushing on. It wasn't on a Sunday? Yeah, yeah. So on the weekend, Saturday Don't or Sunday. Don't they have a so, weekend at Bernie's? So does a whole week go by? <laughs> the mass. It's they they, they get though. a day at, at Bernie's, don't they? Because no, it's a Labor Day weekend. But he says come to the week. To, nah, to I reckon you're right, Astro. Right. Okay. I think you're right. Is there like is there like a two and a half hour cut of this film? <laughs> <laughs> the first day he goes there, they, he gets killed, mm. and then it's just it's another day after that because. Uh, but is it, it on is a Friday? Night stand, isn't it? Is that what we're saying? Because he's gonna oh, go. I don't know. Oh, I'm just trying to get the chronology show. I know it's important for this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. Just, I, I gotta be honest with you guys. I am absolutely sticking with my uh, theory of the two and a half hour weekend of Bernie's cut. <laughs> okay. It's basically the fundamentally the same film, but after. They come in on the Sunday. There's just like 45 minutes of them just having a standard working week <laughs> before the following actual weekend. Happens. Yeah, and you know, I, it went to test audiences. We're just not sure about this 45 minute section of them just working <laughs> for a, a solid, you know, Monday to Friday. Which is it does make sense though, because he's got it. We've got to have the date with Gwen. We've got to have the meeting with Vito and the mobsters. You yeah, know, and there's a there's a lot to get out of the way before mm. we set the table. Well, you as well. I mean, how long was he playing Monopoly for before they, you know, they, you just kind of catch him in the middle of a game? Larry. Yeah, those those Monopoly games can go for hours. <laughs> they, they can, they can, and that was again one of the more questionable moments of the film because all the way through this, you know, the justification, I guess, for them, you know, they, they don't want anyone to find out that uh, Bernie's dead is because they want the party to keep going. Obviously, Richard wants to get into Gwen's lady garments, whatever. And Larry, I assume, just wants to keep living the lifestyle. So they're pretending Bernie's dead. And I assume that Larry's like, oh, well, I'm going to leave, they live this party lifestyle. And the first thing they cut to is him playing Monopoly on his own. I'm like, I don't think this guy has much imagination. I mean, <laughs> Jesus Christ, <laughs> you're in the Hamptons and that's, you know, you've gone to all this effort to get there. And the first thing you do is play a single player version of Monopoly. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ, I'm, dude. I'm so Sorry, surprised that. as well how quick he goes from, ooh, there's a dead body to... Oh, let's keep him around for a weekend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like in mind, it's just like let's not call it like it, his mind just goes so quickly to oh we'll just we'll make we'll keep him as a puppet. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that he smells so like in the second film, like half an hour into it. That's when he starts to smell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's some question marks here over decomposition. Yeah, right. I mean, I'm not a scientist, just to be clear. <laughs> Again, I, I know I'm suggesting that by the end of this film, he should be in a slightly oh. worse state than he yeah. is. I know we're not covering number two just yet, but there's a question about rigor mortis as well and suitcases and everything that we can. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, there's so much about the about death that isn't that they're not covering. I mean, I'm pretty sure that whatever's in you comes out. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. That's, yeah, that's that would ruin the movie. Like if you, if it was like people were like, oh my god, there's... yeah. And I, I, and again, I I've only seen this film once recently. Uh, is it clearly implied that um, what's her name, Catherine Parks as Tina, has sex yes. with the corpse? Yes. That's what I was going. Yes. Speaking of rigor mortis, when she comes down the stairs. <laughs> He's never been better. That's all yeah. right. <laughs> well, I, I I love that scene because it's left to our imagination. You know, we don't see what what happens in there. We we, we just have to imagine what's going on. In yeah. fairness, I think if we did see what was going on there, it might have changed the ratings. I think so. Quite considerably. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I have a question here, and and since we we are from uh we're, we're we're all in the Commonwealth. But you know, we, we we have slightly. I want to get cultural for a second. Now, I what do you guys think? I think this movie is about a vacation. It's a vacation movie, you know. Now, we well, I, I've look, and maybe our American listeners can l let us know, you know, however they like to about this. But when I went to America not not too long ago, uh, uh, just just prior to COVID, um, did a bit of a trip of America, and that they get a glint in their eye when they say this word vacation, we don't have this word vacation. Like they kept saying like, we we're on a big trip. Like, and, and, you know, uh, they didn't, a lot of the people we deal with didn't, didn't really understand. They're like, Oh, how long's your trip? And we're like, Oh, we're away for six weeks. And they were sort of like, they didn't understand like how that was even possible. And, um, cause we're not rich, you know what I mean? We're just like, just going on a bit of a trip. And then they're like, Oh, so you're on, you're on vacation. And then we just go, we'd go, Oh no, just off work, you know, just, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> off work like just on a bit of a holiday you know and they're like, like and but they'd go yeah 
vacation. Like, like they sort of changed their voice to Elizabeth Holmes sort of voice vacation. <laughs> and like, oh, you're going on vacation. Like, like, what does this word mean? I think it mean. I think it. So, do, so from the Welsh perspective as well. Do, what, what, what's your deal with with holidays and vacation? Because this movie is for, I think, for people like a lot of Americans who don't who don't get the chance to get away. Yeah, you have, you have two separate things to do. So you have like the weekend away. We're just going to go away for a weekend. And then you have a holiday. We're just going to go on holiday two weeks, 10 days, seven days, whatever it is. But yeah, vacation is is an odd one. I, I don't I don't see that as just really like really excited. That word vacation is just. Think about I've it. Never they've, understood they've made movies about it. Like it's mm. a word. Yeah. It's so, it's so yeah. charged and you're just like, oh, no, we're just sort of having a bit of time off, you know? <laughs> Yeah, but it's the same, isn't it? Because they call it Christmas vacation as well. So no, no, I, I I totally agree. I feel like there is a different vibe to it. It's 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 some, I, I it's hard to kind of pin down. I think, but it it feels like there is a difference between holiday and vacation, and maybe it is their relationship with holidays or vacations. Because obviously in America, it, I think it's almost seen as maybe a negative sometimes to go on holiday. You know, they they have like that different work ethic. Almost, it's like, you know, it, it seems to be celebrated if you work yourself into the ground. Whereas we're like, dude, that sounds fucking mental. It's like, if you've got holidays, you take every single day of that holiday, yeah. but they don't. And I don't know, like, they, they, they have that big attachment to it. As you say, like, the whole, like, vacation movie series. I, I don't know. Is it just implied, perhaps, that by calling it vacation, that hijinks ensue? Because, you know, there's, there's this, there's the vacation series. Would it be the same if they just called this movie, you know, holiday? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? We get annual leave, don't we? We get actual hours over here, but I don't think a lot of Americans do. They they don't get paid holiday leave. So if it's something that they get to go on, and, and I realize this movie podcast has turned very uh, factual, <laughs> very political, <laughs> yeah. yeah, very factual. Yeah, I've political. opened up. I've said they can, you know, <laughs> let us know. We don't know anything. I don't know anything about America. <laughs> but, uh, but I wonder if they don't think anyone the does. holiday hours. <laughs> So they've actually, they lose money whilst being on vacation. Mm. I mean, that's why it's more uh, important for them, I suppose mm. is the best way to say, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's all wrapped up in their in their work situation and their work ethic as well. I think that the majority of, of Americans probably can't afford to go on vacation. Yeah, it's a luxury. So, yeah, so vacation movies are, um, you know, are a bit more attractive. But this movie, because the reason these movies exist and this movie, like, that exists is because of the that high, the extremism of America, which we all love. We love their extremism. Yeah. We love that, like, you know, if you live in, in New York, you have to live in a, a roach-infested uh, in, infested apartment or you live in Trump Tower, you know? <laughs> like, <Yeah>. <laughs> nothing in between. <laughs> no, I, I think you're right. And I, I don't think this movie necessarily works in the UK. And I, I don't want to speak for you guys, but possibly in, in Australia too, because we're not talking about two, like, like schlubs. I mean, these are white collar workers working in New York City. It's like over here, you know, if you had the same film and it's two white collar workers working for an insurance firm in London and the whole film is about them not being able to afford really going on holiday, you'd be like, well, that's fucking bullshit. Mm -hmm. Of course they can. <laughs> they're white collar workers from London. <laughs> but in America, they, they and again, very, very much from an 80s perspective, that, like, you know, Regan era, Bush senior and all that jazz, is that there was that disconnect, you know, the, the wealthy were so wealthy and everyone else was just doing their damnedest to kind of catch up. And that is partly about, you know, I think I mentioned it earlier about their two different approaches to the same goal, essentially. Both are so desperate to get to the top and Richard's taking the traditional American approach and Larry's taking the, I will do anything. And, you know, often for the sake, because he's just lazier, I suppose. He's just like, I just want to get to the top, but I don't have to do all the hard work. Whereas Richard wants to do the hard work because he thinks that's the American narrative. But, you know, again, this film is at least partly about the the can, the do's and, the, sorry, the has and have nots. I'll, I'll learn to speak eventually. And, you know, again, it, it, it feels very American in that regard. I do love how you said, though, that it wouldn't work over here in London because they can't go on holiday. Nothing to do with the fact that they that we'd catch them out by moving a dead body. It's the fact that we don't believe that they could afford the holiday hours over here. <laughs> That's so true. That the most da it's so damning. <laughs> Your entire five-minute process then was, no, 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 if they're over in London, it's because, <laughs> like, yeah, we won't believe it because they can't afford a holiday. Not the fact that they're cat and a dead body wrong, which is the, the major premise of this film. 
Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's the magic of this film, really, isn't it? You know, it just shifts your <laughs> but, focus. But look, uh, Ricky, maybe you can speak to this, but but what is the deal with why have they, because it makes sense in the sequel, but why have they gone with such an aggressive Calypso theme in this first. <laughs> we, we did we did talk about this uh, off air. Um, I I don't know. I guess I guess it's that that uh, exotic vacation vibe. You know, it speaks to. I mean, there's a whole genre of music that deals with this called exotica music, which is all about. Um, now, now exotica music was a style of music that existed sort of pre Beatles 1950s, and it was basically fake world music that you were supposed to put on as you were lounging by your suburban pool, and it was supposed to transport you to Tahiti or you know exotic places in the South Pacific, and. Um, and yeah, it was it was very escapist. So uh, I think that's in- injected itself uh, into American culture at large, where um, yeah, any sort of vacation is underscored with uh, yeah, with, with with exotic world music. So you get a lot of calypso music in this in this film, and even more so in Weekend at Moody's too, because they actually mm. go to to the uh, American Virgin Islands, but. Um, also, you've got Andy Summers, who uh, is a member of the police, who are famous for kind of ripping off Jamaican and and Calypso grooves uh, in their music. So, can you do that now? Can you just go now? Like, if I was like, here's my band now, and like, and I was just doing the like the police. If I was just like doing, you know, you know how they just because they do fake. Jamaican accents, right? Yeah, yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's not happening. Now. That's not happening now. It's no. Just not happening, well, it? you would need you would need a token uh, a token person of color. In I couldn't band. just go, you know, uh, walk the streets for money. <laughs> yeah, walking on the moon, walking yeah. on the moon, like kind of, and then like I play it for the for the, for the exec, and they just go, okay, uh, uh, and then they they just immediately call the Hollywood Reporter, and I'm cancelled. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I, I liked how this going, but I did notice that a lot of you are um, very white. So uh, yeah, we're not sure if this is going to work out, guys. To be honest. Uh, but, well, I mean, we live in a world where a girl gets absolutely slaughtered for wearing a kimono to a you know a, a prom. So I'm thinking, you know, uh, 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 us kind of showing up as a group, all speaking or singing in Jamaican accents and being like, "Listen, is this going to work? I'm I'm going to shoot." But this myself. movie is 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 all about it. Like it's it's you know we've got. Um, Hot and Cold by Jermaine Stewart. And what's the other one? The other one's called Island Girl, Burning Flames, and then the entire score. So they Mm. would see it was just a difference in perspective. In the 80s, they had the view that, you know, and I'm not saying this is 100% correct, but they they did have the view of, oh, you know, we we live in this one world, and and we, and we should share cultures, and we should we should explore different cultures, and and you know, amplify different cultures in the in the best way in in the only way we can. And sometimes, yeah, you know, you get deeply offensive stuff, and then other other times you get we get um you know Graceland, we get like mm. amazing stuff, like like in, in nowadays, like yeah, we wouldn't. It, that's the thing. So now they go okay, stay in your lane, and we would you wouldn't get I wouldn't be able to do my Calypso band, which is you know that's a shame. Which is a which is a crime. But, <laughs> but by the same token, what that what the people the ideologues who believe that you know are happy with is is you, they're happy with no graceland they're happy with so that paul simon album graceland are one of the greatest world music albums ever they'd be happy for that not to exist mm. do you know and, what I mean? and no no peter no peter gabriel as well no peter gabriel oh yeah peter gabriel what does he know i mean he's obviously a racist right and you go well mm. i don't know he's he's being pretty pretty um respectful and amazing at the same time yeah well it's it's, it's just the way that works it's, it's such a shame that we have to kind of uh, you know appeal to the lowest common denominator it's like everyone instead of like you say using the graceland example nowadays the standard would be to use the horrendously racist example at the other end of the spectrum of why we can't have this rather than you going but yeah but look when it works it, it's just it's the it can be amazing but everyone would be like yeah but when it goes wrong dude you know <laughs> it's it's pretty fucking rough so it's it's a shame that the the conversation has moved to that side. And of the look, in, in, since we're in this area, I'm not saying that when uh, Larry you know finds the note and it says uh, Rich, Richard Parker and I stole this money from the company to pay for my sex change operation, <laughs> and then afterwards yeah. he says, uh, "Oh, not only is he doing blah blah blah, he's, he's turning me into a drag queen." Yep. <laughs> I'm not saying that's I'm not saying that's good, you know. I'm just saying that. Um, but is it? I don't know if it's that big a deal. And, and sorry, it was just you saying his full name. 
Did anyone else have an issue? Have any of you guys seen um, Life of Pi? I, no. The movie. I, I know not. this is a shift in no, conversation, no, no. a pretty dramatic turn to the right. But th- there's a character in that, but the, the, the tiger in the film is called Richard Parker as well. So all I can hear is that Indian accent over and over again. Oh, Richard Parker. He's always Wait. shouting for this So how this, come this it's offensive for me to do the Jamaican thing and then you just did Indian <laughs> but me not to, uh, yes, he, is that offensive? It, it's weird. Well, I, I was trying to explain this to a friend recently. It, it seems to be certain accents are acceptable. No, no, no. The rule is that. simple. The rule is simple. It's it's you're only allowed to be if you want to do a Russian accent, you can you can be the most offensive. You can just say, talk about the Kremlin, how you're gonna kill everyone. You can you can just be the worst guy ever, or probably South African as well. And that's from that's from the old days. Yeah. And uh now uh, but if you do anything else. You know, um, then uh, it's beyond the pale. But you're telling me I can't do my Jamaican <laughs> accents whenever I want. Is that what you're trying it's to say? Uh, I want people to understand it's that. Absolutely rats. I, I love it. See, that's the thing. I want people to understand it's a wicked accent. And that's why it's, I desperately kind of wish I had that Jamaican accent a bit. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it would be so much fun to just just speak in a Jamaican oh, accent. Please, and from now on, Cyborg Cinema to... would be such a great podcast. <laughs> <laughs> just Jamaican for hey, don't, don't you guys in the UK have something called Jafakin? A Jafakin accent? Jafakin? Yeah. I'm not aware of Jafakin. No, I thought... I feel like... I thought that it, was it sounds like, like a... something I would love. Yeah. I, I need to I need to I need to check this out. But no, but is it, isn't this like an, yeah, it's, an affected uh, it's, accent? It's a London it's London so. English, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jafika is the is the London English. Yeah. So it's uh I'm just doing a quick Google now. Multicultural London English is a socialite of English that emerged in the late twentieth century. So it's basically all the people that came over from Jamaica mm. and we've just carried it on by the sounds mm-hmm. of it in some of the London. Uh, see the 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 problem with that is that any attempt to do that suggests it would take some kind of subtlety. Uh, my 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 impressions are pretty broad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's it, it's just going to be Jamaica. I'm not going to be doing London Jamaica. Just vaguely Jamaica, you know. But so, AJ, yeah, do, do you think so um you know maybe I should start doing the Jamaican accent? Yeah, yeah. I do. Oh, good. I think Thank lean you. in. What you mean? Lean you mean in. indefinitely and all welcome time. to Sad Bob Cinema. <laughs> <laughs> and you know when you do that voice i just did this i was ju- i was sort of like like jumping up and down a little bit like sort of jo- like you know like i was you know it gave me a lot of energy so i think it could it could really work out <laughs> that's what i'm saying i think we would be up for a good time yeah no i i think yeah i think certain accents you just kind of naturally change the style i'm pretty sure whenever i do a south african accent i immediately just look meaner <laughs> I think it's just a thing I do. <laughs> I just associate with them. I'm just like, well, it's just in my head. Like, you know, we obviously we live across the other side of the world. So my association with South Africans is that they're just all villains in movies. That's right. Like that's it. I was so, waiting for that. Yeah. So yeah, basically Lethal Weapon Two and and Hard Target. Oh, oh yeah, Hard Target. No, Arnold uh, Hard Target. Yeah. <laughs> so I have like the issue the- now that you know. My way into a South African accent is totally associated now with District District Nine. Mm. So I've got to start every sentence with Braun. I've got to say Braun before I can say anything else. You know, it's it's very strange thing. I think everyone has their own way into terrible accents. So yeah, yeah, my, mine is prawns. Very odd. Well, uh, I we probably should start bringing in number two, perhaps. Um, oh please, there, please. Oh, I mean, yeah, this this feels like the perfect time. Are there are it? there any bits and pieces from this first one that anyone wants to remember? Uh, just throw in there. Uh, I I want to talk about my favorite part of one of my favorite parts of the first movie is the kid. I knew, I, I knew the kid oh, was going to yeah. come up. Yes, I love, I love a shitbag kid that that pulls the finger, that swears. Uh, when when he be- when he starts burying Bernie for the second time at okay, the end okay. of the film. Okay, Ricky, I just lost it. I loved it. Okay, so the kid goes. So the kid, like you know, raises them up and runs away, and then he goes. He turns back to them, uh, Larry and Richard. And he goes. How'd you like to kiss this? And then he, <laughs> yes. he points to his butt. And then um, Larry goes, kiss my ass. <laughs> oh. Doesn't he say as well? Like it gets pretty dark, right? I'm pretty sure he says, I'm gonna rip your gums out. Yes. I was like, God damn. <laughs> that is pretty that's pretty nice. Oh, I mean, that kid's that, don't get me wrong, that kid is clearly a terror, <laughs> but I'm not sure that would be my opening response to an age. <laughs> Uh, um, I wanted to mention now. This is look. I don't. 
look, this might even be, be inappropriate because, you know, we don't know each other very well. But I think that um, uh, with Bernie and Tina, uh, like chicks grabbing crankshafts and the guy going, oh, <laughs> like, <laughs> that'll yeah. always be funny. I don't I agree. Know. I don't agree. You think like what the hell is yeah. that? It's like it's like it's it's something that, like she's going straight for it. And, and no, and she she uses her foot and really smushes yeah. in there. <laughs> yeah. AJ, did you notice? I of course I noticed. Frank loved it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good, but like it's something about a woman like you know, just like uh, like just moving too far. It. Moving too fast, and and the guy going, oh, like, <laughs> Especially when a dude's sitting next to her. I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's rock and roll. Uh, hey, just, just quickly before we move on, I've got a little bit of trivia on the first film here. Okay. Um, uh, the only thing I wanted to mention, sorry, before we go into the trivia about the first one was how hot must it be in New York to melt the tar on the roof? Mm. <laughs> I really felt hot from watching Yeah, it. I really did. I thought they really yeah. sold it to me. This was, I was like, God, that like, looks so uncomfortable. I've never, I've never come across just a hot day that has melted the road. <laughs> Well, actually, that sometimes happens in Australia, yeah, where 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 you have to shut down, you have to shut down the trains because uh, the train tracks and and the surrounding kind of uh, bitumen melts. Yeah. Oh, that's my Welsh head. Where it just there's nothing but rain over here. Then that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're we're living in a world where it's like. It's 27 degrees and we all start just kind of passing out immediately. I was like, you're talking to Australians who, I, I mean, I've run the numbers. How, how many miles is it you live from the sun? Like seven or eight? <laughs> it's a ridiculous country. I mean, some of the temperatures you guys have to deal with are outrageous. Uh, uh. Again, very quick. I just, because, uh, sorry, you guys have this obviously much longer history with um, with the film growing up with it. Like, what is the view on Catherine Mary Stewart, uh, Gwen Storm? Is it Gwen Saunders, the character? Um, it, it's, you know, did everyone have, a, like, a crush on her growing up? Yeah, well, I didn't really know her very well. Like, but but I, I I must say, just as a bit of, uh, uh, you know, she's also in another movie we watched uh, called The Beach Girls. So. Oh. She's, she plays oh. one of the um the the beach bunnies in that movie, but she seemed just like a a wasp, you know, sort of like one of these these eighties, yeah, sort of sweater over the shoulder wasp mm. chicks, you know, that like yeah, yeah. Well, that that was the thing. Like, watch it. Like, you know, when I was growing up, I think of like a lot of the kind of crushes I had were like Phoebe Cates, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Shoes, I wanted, sort of people like that. I'm still waiting for <laughs> Rebecca De Mornay to come over to my house with the wind machine blowing. You know, like I want, <laughs> I'm, I want that. You know, that's yeah, yeah. what I want. You know, <laughs> the only thing I remember Catherine Mary Stewart from, uh, which I actually enjoyed her, in, was the last staff like that. That was oh, the yes. uh, mm. the one for me. Yeah, that's she was great. Ages. Uh, so believe it or not, the the scene when when Bernie is water skiing, that 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 is not that is not a, a dummy body. That is a stunt man. Okay, oh, wow. now a stunt man he broke several ribs when filming that scene. Okay, and my question is, yeah, couldn't they have used a mannequin of some sort? Like that just seems fucking crazy to me. Um, well, I think the answer to that is almost immediately responsive. Like. Weekend at Bernie's too. They they go the full mannequin route, and of course they have to for certain circumstances, i.e. the fridge and the suitcase. Mm. But it's another one of those things that I think makes the second film look quite shonky by comparison. It's just like it's so clearly a mannequin. Mm. But you know they go that extra mile in the first film, mm, for sure. you know, and I think it makes a difference. They grab a stunt double to play dead whilst dragging him along the the water. <laughs> I mean, I do agree. Maybe a mannequin might have been a bit better. <laughs> yeah. For sure, I do. I, I think I honestly, I think it's the little details which elevate this film. You know, this is a this is a Ted Kotcheff film. So you're He's saying not fucking rant. You're saying broken ribs worth it? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I, I might have felt differently, as I said, if I hadn't just watched Weekend in Bernie's too. With all those terrible, like with the bits with like the um, when he's on the like he's pretending to be a horse or whatever it is, and you know you can just <laughs> totally see that it's a mannequin. Tell. It's just the so worst. Weekend of Bernie's so, two is yeah, yeah. knocking at the door. Ricky, come on! <laughs> it is. But just let it in. Just let it in. <laughs> so uh, two men once pulled a real life weekend at Bernie's and were arrested for abusing a corpse. In 2011, Robert Young and Mark Robinson found their friend Jeffrey Jarrett unresponsive at his home. Instead of calling 911, they took him out for a night of fun, <laughs> all paid for with Jarrett's credit card, including visiting a strip club 
where they use Jarrett's card to take out four hundred dollars from the ATM. Um, so yes, yeah, so they swore that they didn't know their friend was dead at the time, but they both pled guilty <laughs> and were each given two years of probation as well as community service. <laughs> So that seems like a, a, a very small uh, sentence for such a irresponsible thing to do. Like, like he could have still been alive when they first found him. Like, like call nine one one. You know. Mm-hmm. Do you think maybe they got away with? Like, do you think the the, the sentence was reduced just for the sheer ambition of it? <laughs> yeah, yeah like, probably. I mean, don't get me wrong; they've broken a lot of a lot of laws. But I mean, fair play to those guys. I can't believe they went through. <laughs> yeah, with the, it, you know, <laughs> the the judge the judge must have been a weekend at Bernie's fans. So- the major question, the major question about all of that is, how did they get his pin number? <laughs> I don't know. Like they took money out of the ATM. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Good point. We, we clearly <laughs> haven't got all the details. May, yet, maybe so. they just fudged it. They just went, "Oh, what's his? We we know his birth date. It must be that." Or it's, or <laughs> yeah, it's six nine out. six nine, like at my dad's. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I mean, it's a ballsy move. I'd be able to give like your own <laughs> pin number away online, but to just randomly give away other people's. But, yeah, I, mean, I love I it. love the pride that your dad probably said now. Oh, I love well, that. Like, what my pin number is. <laughs> <laughs> he probably winks at you every time he puts puts the number in. He loves oh, yeah, it. You, have to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you know, like you're at a cash machine, and most people are like pretty careful about making sure people behind can't see. Where I'd just be like clearly standing out the way. I like making full eye contact is like putting six nine six nine really slowly, really intently. <laughs> I get I get Rob blind in no time, but I feel like it'd be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, shall we do Weekend at Bernie's too? Hit me. Oh, please. Okay, the boys are back. Larry and Rich pick up where they left off, only this time with loads of fake tan. The film opens with the boys making a positive identification of Bernie's body at a downtown New York City morgue. Larry claims to be Bernie's nephew so that he can get some of Bernie's possessions, including his Rolex watch and his credit cards. Later that day at the insurance company, Larry and Rich are quizzed by their bosses and an internal investigator about the whereabouts of the missing $2 million. They deny knowing where the money is. Their boss, not believing a word they say, promptly fire the two and sends the investigator, Arthur Hummel, played by Barry Bostwick, off to prove their guilt. Meanwhile, in the Virgin Islands, a voodoo queen named Mobu is hired by mobsters to find the $2 million that Bernie stole. She sends two servants, Harry and Charles, played by Steve James and Tom Wright, to New York to get Bernie's body, perform a voodoo ceremony to reanimate him and bring him back to her so he can lead her to the money. Their attempts to bring Bernie back to life are plagued by accidents. They prepare the ceremony, but having lost the sacrificial chicken, use a pigeon instead. This somehow limits Bernie's ability to walk towards the hidden money. He can only move when he hears music. A great way for the filmmakers to inject a shitload of Caribbean flavoured music into the film. Uh, Harry and Charles later lose Bernie on the subway. Over dinner, Larry reveals to Rich that he has a key to a safety deposit box located in St. Thomas in the US Virgin Islands. Larry convinces Rich to borrow Bernie to gain access to the safety deposit box. The two find Bernie and after stuffing him in a small suitcase, they leave for the Virgin Islands. The guys successfully use Bernie uh, to open his safety deposit box but find no money, instead they find a handwritten map. Meanwhile, Larry befriends a lovely local girl named Claudia, played by Troy Bayer, and enlists her help in making sense of the map, which she takes possession of to show her father. Later, Larry and Rich are captured by Henry and Charles, who take them to Mobu, the voodoo queen. They force Rich to drink a poisonous potion and tells him that they must find the map by sundown to get the antidote. After being reunited with Claudia, they are shocked to discover that Bernie is moving and realise he's leading them towards the two million. 
To keep him moving, they put a Walkman with headphones on his head. Bernie finds a large chest in the ocean, but he does not let go of it. They end up attaching Bernie to a horse carriage with music playing after some terrifying out-of-control moments. Eventually, the carriage ends up at Mobu's place. Bernie hits a large tree branch and spins out of control, knocking out Mobu and dropping the chest, which breaks open onto the ground. Larry hides some of the money and gives the remaining amount to Hummel, the investigator. With Mobu knocked out, Claudia's father, a medical doctor familiar with voodoo, says that he can cure Rich if he can get the blood of a virgin, which Larry confesses he can provide. The mobsters and Mobu are arrested. Larry confesses to Rich that he returned the two million to the insurance company, but only after learning Bernie actually stole three million. Larry and Richard use some of the remaining million to purchase a yacht crewed by smoking hot blondes. Meanwhile, Bernie is last seen leading Henry and Charles, who have been transformed into goats by voodoo, through a carnival parade to an unknown fate. Hey, you guys are what the fuck. This movie... <laughs> Honestly, I mean... The first thing to say about about this is it's really good to see that the Matrix Reloaded got the idea from the rave scene from this. <laughs> like, yeah. When Henry and Charles are rocking up, I could have sworn that they were in, what was the Zion, I think it's called? Zion, yeah, yeah. It's Zion, yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And that, and their weird under, was it? Underground orgy dance, yeah, it's uh, yeah. pretty bizarre <laughs> scene. Fairness. Well, this film is is so much. Uh, it, it's much more cartoony than the first one and it even yeah. the, the movie even opens with the, the opening credits is mm. a cartoon uh, of them i knew i'd around. hate it straight away like as soon as i saw that horrible intro sequence it, it reminded me remember um city slickers it, mm. it, it yeah. had a very similar intro it seemed to be a thing in the early 90s and i never liked them no. and this one is a really bad one yeah. and it, like you say it immediately gives you the vibe that this is going to be a much cartoonish take on you know a pretty cartoonish premise but they tried at least in the first one to kind of you know, give you an excuse for these things happening. It's like, you know, uh, Richard always is like, I'm not into this anymore. And then Gwen keeps showing up. They, they just abandon all that. And to my mind, what it reminded me of is, remember all those like films from the 80s, like, you know, Robocop, Beetlejuice, they all ended up with their own, like usually ill-advised cartoon shows, which would yes. kind of sit alongside them. It felt like they had a script for a cartoon, like a Saturday morning thing. And then mm. they just turned it into a movie instead. It, yes. it's, it's so bizarre. It did seem like a like a pitch for for that series, you know, like like an animated mm. series. Yeah, yeah. Stranger things have happened. Well, what he said about uh, that he was a virgin at the end because he made a joke in the first one about uh, Larry made a joke in the first after she came down from the old rigor mortis sex. Uh, Larry made a joke of if I lie there, I get in trouble. Like, why would he make that joke? He's a liar. Yeah. Yeah, I know he's a liar, but he's making himself seem bad <laughs> by saying that. So he's pretending that he's not a virgin in the first one by making mm. him sound like he's a shit lover. <laughs> like, <laughs> but we, we've discussed that Larry is uh, a terrible human being. And yeah. um, <laughs> he is off the chain in this movie. His language is much more callous and crude as well. Like he says, like in this one, he says, he just says straight up, like you don't hear this in, in movies uh, anymore. I know exactly what you're going to say. You know what I'm going to say. He oh, says, yeah. oh, oh my God, look at the tits on that one. <laughs> 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 the tits on that one. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like that it's... is crazy. And Richard, as soon as he hears that, he's like, he's, he's trying to be all business. As soon as he hears that, no, 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 I'll abandon everything I'm going to do to to come out and stare as well. It's just, it's. <laughs> yeah. he, he actually has a few lines which I like. That was like the top one. That, but it was like really in the film, like early in the film, he says, "Oh yeah, he was really raping the company right under your nose." I was like, "God, yeah, that, was my, that was my second uh, uh, quote I was going to mention." He's really raping the company. He also disrespects other cultures. He just totally doesn't care about the mm. voodoo. Like he's just yeah. like picking up the stuff and yeah. saying, "Yeah, yeah, whatever." Yeah, and it's always followed by that weird, goofy laugh, which wasn't really present in the first film mm. and and i think you mentioned it earlier somehow they've made him look weird I, it's it's hard to kind of put my finger on it but he just looks weird in this film uh, well first of all it's the fake tan but i think also it's yeah. the four years between mm. the first one you know yeah they, they just don't look they they've aged you know yeah like i think he was like pushing the bound but he definitely had that kind of like fresh face thing going on in the first one. Like, you still very much felt like, you know, the Brat Pack kid kind of thing. But in this film, like, at somewhere in between 1989 and 19, 
93 or whatever it was, he just very much became an adult, but he's still trying to play off that he's that fresh faced kid. And I, yeah. I think the fact, you know, you mentioned the fact that he's so much more crass, it feels even worse coming from what appears to be a full grown adult. And it's just, I, I just don't think it ever works. Although it does lead to the line, swim with the fishes, you zombie bastard. So I'm willing to give him a free pass out to a certain <laughs> point. So, you know. of, all the things, of all the things in this film that make him just an insane person, we've already said, like an awful person, it's the fact that he eats crisps or potato chips out of the fridge. <laughs> oh. like, <laughs> like, what, what the fuck are they doing in the fridge? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> You absolute animal. Like, you call <laughs> potato chips or crisps, as we call them. Well, add that to the list, though. He commits fraud, he forges, <laughs> he steals, and he's, um, he's frankly building up to a rape. You know? He, he's clearly, <laughs> clearly. I mean, I, I get the impression that if he was that if he was more physically imposing, I, I think rape would have occurred. I mean, it was it was going down that route, wasn't it? Uh, AJ, Ooh. what do you think of his sex pest lies? Oh you know? No, like he, he said the old what about the old <laughs> Oh, you sound so sad. <laughs> and rightly so. And rightly so. What about the old you know, paying and hashtag complicit, the taxi driver is involved oh, in yeah. sexual crime. He wanted that extra twenty. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, to take off down the road because I'm this is Harvey Weinstein stuff. You know, it's <laughs> oh, like yeah. He says shit like, I remember how, how all that shit Harvey says. He says, he says, like, you know, we'll go down and get your jacket and don't let, don't leave. Like, he's got all these little, little tips and tricks to try and, you know, ensure that you come up and then he'll po- come out with the robe on, you know, and say, give me a it's, rub down. It's nasty. Mm. But like you said, the taxi drivers, I mean, he's basically said to him, it's like, here's $20 to drive away from a sex crime. I mean, that's, I mean, that's exactly what's going to happen. But yeah. yeah, that that whole scene is just super creepy. Super. Creepy. Richie is a sex pest in this as well. Like the conga dance line. Like, could he have been any further up that woman as he's trying to <laughs> dance? <back? laughs> he, he is. Ve- he is very crotch forward though i did notice that <laughs> i was like all right we get it it's a conga line but it's like nobody's crotch needs to be that far in front of them it's just completely unnecessary well speaking of dancing i think one of the the, the funny elements of this film is bernie's physicality with the Absolutely. dancing is is really really funny and it actually spawned a dance craze if you don't know i think in 2011 or maybe it's 2006 i don't have it in my notes here but there was a dance craze uh with a, a rapper coming out with a song called move like bernie and it's uh <laughs> it spawned it spawned a whole lot of so uh, like a U- early youtube videos of people dancing like bernie and even even some prominent nfl stars in america when they do their touchdown actually did the Bernie move a few times. So See, and the great thing, I, I feel like there's room for kind of scope for improvement there. Like if I was, say, if I was in the NFL, I score a touchdown. I don't just do the, the basic Bernie dance. What I do is I lay face down in the first. And for the first, say, 20 seconds, it's all ass. It's just all ass. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, just doing that little <laughs> wiggle that he does back and forth as I slowly <laughs> get to my feet. Already it's got, like, 60 seconds in, it's still mostly me just wiggling my back. It's got very weird. The stadium doesn't it, know how to deal with it. It does look like Bernie invented the twerk, doesn't it, in that one? But, but that's the thing. I feel like he's getting no credit for the, the, the for popularizing the twerk, like like because that move is, um, you know, uh, a TikTok uh, standard. You know what I mean? Like like and 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 here we have, you know, back in the day, like I don't even know what a nineteen ninety three audience would make of that. They'd go, oh, he's shaking his bottom. You know, <laughs> yeah, I think that like, like yeah, that's yeah. why because we're all listening to Sir Mix a lot, going like because ass wasn't as massive like as it is like now we are we are in the era of the ass okay this is like 80s was a we can all era. we can all agree on that for sure yeah mm. yeah 80s was titties so like when so that's why so mix a lot song was bigger it was like oh look it's all about butts you know <laughs> but 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 shake it good bernie's shaking his butt where because because that's if you look at like like what does richard look at he's he's looking at the chick with the long blonde hair and like her big bazongas is what he's looking at, you know? <laughs> so I feel like I've lost my point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I, there is that kind of, uh, especially with 80s films, like 
there's always that totally unnecessary, unnecessary boob scene. Like even in this film, like the scene on the beach when it goes past, it's like, well, yeah, <laughs> I guess you can make an argument either way. <laughs> but, you know, it might not narratively be required, should we say. But they, they always snuck them in. It's like we always say, it's like Die Hard. Is there a reason for that, you know, that weird sex scene right at the start of the film? I mean, maybe in this film, you know, there's a lot of girls on the beach. But still, if somebody's looked at that script and said, listen, we've got to get some titties out at some point. We just have to. And, you know, they play to them. They make it work. Mm. Well, look, I, I just want to go back to something I said at the beginning and get your guys' ideas because... You, I I honestly think now uh, what I was struck by we've we slammed the movie, but you know Oscar Wilde once said that all bad poetry is sincere, and um, <laughs> I think I think I was wondering if we could get a cultural aside into Weekend of Bernie Sue, and <laughs> sir, you have achieved it. <laughs> I think that there is genuine craft in this movie, you know, and I, and I, they didn't set out to make a bad movie, and. Um, I can see some some stuff in the script that is is quite innovative and clever in 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 and of itself. Like the um, uh, I think Bernie's voodoo walk or dance is a, a interesting uh, sort of left field. Uh, evolution of the first film i think that um charles and henry um uh, our our two the other two guys um in the movie steve james and the other guy uh they've been cursed and they're going to turn into uh you know and then they're, they're sort of like a a shadow plot they're kind of two other two new idiots mm. like shadowing the main thread of our other our main idiots uh they bring a new flavor uh it it also you know we shift we lose that satire as you said uh uh, Liam, but we all, but what we gain is it becomes a treasure hunt. Do you know what I mean? And that's probably why the, uh, this film is a bit different. But, but the last thing I'll say is I think that I like the attitude of this movie. I I think that, you know, it turns up the heat because, you know, the, to be frank, the first one isn't Caddyshack. You know what I mean? We've said the first one, there's more that that first one feels mm, slicker and better and somehow a little bit more on point. But Ultimately, it's not Ghostbusters or Caddyshack, so we're not trampling over some something that you know. It's not like we're adding a new verse to Hey Jude. Do you know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah. so uh, the attitude of this movie is very different, and that's why I don't care. It's got this sort of Jason X quality, this sort of like bonkers uh, uh, po- posture that I think um, is they're just going a hundred hundred percent. What do we think? There's two things to mention, isn't there, in, in this? The first, and we've already said off air, that if you think of Weekend at Bernie's, if anyone mentions it, a lot of people would probably think of the stuff that happens in number two, like the music, making him walk and everything like that. And the second thing would be, would you want to watch an, a sequel that was basically the same as the first one, where they're just cat in a dead book, or the fact that now this is completely different, and he's walking on his own with the help of voodoo. Mm. Now it's it's as you said, left field. It's just totally gone. <laughs> well, what's what's interesting is in the first movie, their big problem is getting Bernie to move around. How do we get him to move? But in the second movie, the problem is how do we get him to stop moving? You know, he keeps going missing <laughs> on his own. Like, how do we stop that? You know, that's great. That's great. An inversion. Well, when you think about it. This movie is an auteur picture, okay? This is Robert Klein, the writer of the first movie. This is written and direct. This is un film de Robert Klein, okay? <laughs> this is a, this is his vision. He's he's like finally got Kotchip out of the way. Now I can get down to business. So what you're seeing in this movie is his vision, okay? And it's Bernie twerking on the beach. Yeah, uh, yeah apparently so. I mean, I, I disagree with nearly everything you said, but... <laughs> I mean, no, no, you, you, you kind of almost kind of won me over there because I actually, I actually think this film was appallingly bad, like really bad. I, I found that, as I said, because I, I was kind of low key falling in love with Andrew McCarthy by the end of the first <laughs> film, and then to have that ripped away by just him just being horrendous in the second film. But I mean, one, they kind of painted themselves into a corner because Bernie very much is dead. And, you know, how do you bring him back again? And they're like, well, I, it's going to have to be voodoo, I guess. 
And then, you know, <laughs> but that was always the, the you know, it, we, we, we've covered a few other films, Marked for Death, Serpent and Rainbow. Uh, the, the voodoo was on, on the cards. It was like it was it was absolutely. definitely something mm. you could go to. The, uh, the question, when it comes to the voodoo, the question I have is, would the fried chicken have worked? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, it's still a chicken, as Steve James said. It's still yeah. a chicken. Like, would that have worked? Mm. Maybe, maybe. Well, because well, the, no, the premise of the movie is built upon their idea that they used a pigeon. So they used a pigeon, and that's why they, they blew it, you know? So if they used the, well, the chicken's got to be alive, but he would have done, like, sort of like the different types of kryptonite, he would have done something different. Do you know what I mean? Like, if it had been the fried chicken, it would have been, it would have, I don't know, like he, he would have been crawling on the ground or something or whatever. I mean, already you can see how different the conversation is for, the, for this film. It, it's insane how different it is. We're far from I, home, I, is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but I, I think I think he made like a great point earlier the fact that like, like I was watching this as a sequel to the first film. And I think that is a mistake because if you do watch it, as you say, almost as like a, a rat race kind of film, as like a caper, it does work a lot better. You know, if you just kind of abandon any association to the real world, any association with common sense, and it's playing for like broader laughs, I'm like, ah, maybe, maybe there, there is a reason that people have a fondness for this film, despite the is, fact that it's a bit is, rubbish. It's, well, I suppose we're also talking about, uh, you know, where ideas come from and how they change and evolve because, you know, we have the the burden of knowledge, as Stephen Pinker says, you know, and basically we can't imagine a film, we can't imagine a world without Weekend of Bernie. So <laughs> 10 minutes after Absolutely. Weekend of Bernie's came out and people were dressing up as him and putting the sunnies on and doing whatever and talking about it, that's why you've got the cartoon at the beginning of the second one is because it's four years of people talking about this movie and, and you know, laughing and joking and sneering and, you know, and secretly watching it on cable and whatever. And therefore, it sort of builds this life of its own. And it, and then at least the people uh, who were part of one of the, the main guy, uh, the producer and the writer of the first one are on this film, sometimes you know, we, we get these, these, uh, these ideas change. It's like Ghostbusters. So in Ghostbusters, you know, it's a, it's a business film, you know, about how to start a ghost busting business, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, it's very grounded and whatnot. And, you know, one of the, one of the ghosts they meet is this, you know, terrifying green slime monster call and then cut to the second movie, the, the slime monsters fucking driving a bus. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then cut to absolutely. now, cut cut to now, and there's a Mrs. Slimer. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And then, then yeah. there's a cartoon. In the fucking cartoon, Slimer's one of the Ghostbusters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, no, I, I was someone we were talking about on a recent podcast as well. This is a common thing, a common idea that these these execs have. They go, oh, well, you know why, you know why they love Slimer? You know why they love Slimer? <laughs> so anyway, Slimer's on the bus, and no one's in the room to say, okay, do you understand Slimer was just one ghost that, like, they attacked and he wasn't, he doesn't need to be part of No, no, no. So anyway, Slimer's, he's one of the Ghostbusters now. He's one of the Ghostbusters. And you say, no, is he? Is he? <laughs> is he really? I, I think a lot of these, like, they do become a victim of their own success and, we were saying that with um, when we're doing the Karate Kid podcast, it's like Pat Morita. It's like he's he's just become this kind of caricature of like wax on, wax off and stuff. And you go back and watch the first film, and you're like, it's actually a really nuanced performance. But yeah. because he's become such a cultural phenomenon, by now it's just those kind of like key moments. Say, and you just say, say I think line. it's the same with this film. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. It's you know, just Bart become Simpson, the, the line thing. Like in popular culture by that point, it's just like, listen, people just want to see. Bernie walking around and being dead. And it's just like, well, listen, if we add the voodoo, that we can do that for a solid hour and a half. And that's exactly what they do. Liam, just because I didn't like the Karate Kid on that podcast, you don't have to push it again for other people. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, you're still wrong and I'm still very upset, but I'll, I'll get it. <laughs> Let's talk about the investigator, Arthur Hummel. Oh, I wanted to. Barry Bostwick. Like, oh my, yep. For the fact that he's a terrible investigator. <laughs> the worst. And, and, he, and he also uh, loves a good upskirt as well. Oh, loves it. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, to, just in case you weren't sure how horrendous he is, He's like, I'm going to get a couple of upskirts as well. Yeah. But how they didn't know he was on the same uh, bus as them going to <laughs> I know, I know. I picked that straight. As soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, my God, how do they not know he's on the bus, on the bus you know? Yeah, it's like he wants to get caught. It's like when he breaks into his house, it's mm. like he, he, he goes into the window, which he's sitting next to. Yeah, he's asleep, but he goes right past him. He then shines a light directly into his face as if to say, dude, seriously, I want to get caught. I, I don't know. And he, then he uses what can only be described as the loudest camera of all time. It, it, yeah, his whole performance <laughs> is better. So 
And I'm not sure if it's even really needed, but you know, that's the kind of film work. Mm. <laughs> Um, well, look, you've already mentioned a couple of things. I need to run through a quite a, a lengthy list of, of Me Too uh, issues mm, mm. from both films. And perhaps you can just jump in when something takes your fancy. So, <laughs> you know, this is the rap sheet of these movies. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about the, the, the rating a bit later. But so in the first movie, it, you know, they start, they start, but this is just, an, it's actually, this is not barely, this is not really on the Me Too. Well, maybe it is a bit, a bit, bit on there, but there's an ADR line in the first movie. Uh, I don't know if you guys listen to it on headphones. A guy's walking past in the background on Gwen and uh, Richard's date, and he's talking to what I assume is a woman of the night uh, and says to her, uh, uh, baby, you, you're not a woman. C- come on, t- tell me the truth. So <laughs> there's a little bit of um, trans. Um, Transphobia. Well, you know, phobia, he seems to be into it. I don't know. Right. Like, you know, I'm just saying there's <laughs> trans stuff going on. Uh, Larry leers at Gwen on the way to the elevators, uh, chuckling and raising eyebrows. Um, did you, did, did, this is the very first of the first movie. Uh, you know, Larry's just like, because you can't, you can't just walk around like staring at people. And then when they look at you like funny, just like go, mm, like raise your eyebrows like suggestively. Like that's, we don't do that. <laughs> no, uh, no, we don't. She's a summer intern. Um, they talk about her like that, like she'll be gone in a week, like, you know, it's a hit and run operation, you know what I'm saying? Um, there, there's an assault in the elevator. I think um, uh, Larry hits, it actually touches her on the shoulder, you know, uh, so that's mm. like that's not, not, not on. Richard engages in uh, quite a lot of gaslighting, uh, blackmailing to, to get sex, you know. He says... <laughs> My aunt is very sick. He's, mm. he's saying, like, I don't leave my parents. My parents died. You know, that's all just mm. to get sex. Well, you, you know, know uh, you know, Ted Kotcheff makes a cameo as the dad. <laughs> okay. He was great. Yeah. Maybe I'll lay you up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Bernie gives money to a, a, uh, someone on the Hamptons and he says, buy yourself a girlfriend. Um, because that's what you do. You, you know, oh, women, of course, yeah. He also he also says booze and women. That's my lifestyle, and I love it. That's fair. I think that is fair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I give him a free, I give him a free pass on that. One, for sure. <laughs> when Tawny comes in, possibly the hottest movie in both uh, hottest chick in both of these movies. Uh, she, you know, she says she's kitted out in a bikini. She says, "I'm hi, I'm Tawny," and Larry says, "Hi, I'm horny." Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> AJ, yeah. is that sound of a line that would work? Or <laughs> maybe, maybe. So, <laughs> a guy only, a guy, only if he's hot, though. Only if he's hot, and he's cashed up. Yeah, a guy. Uh, one of the disgusting. What, you old... mean like you would have to be you, like like cash in hands, like just so you know. <laughs> in this style, maybe. Money. Yeah. <laughs> One of the disgusting guys at the party says to Gwen, nice outfit. It would look nicer crumpled on my floor in the morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> can't laugh at that, okay? It's, it's, it's a sexual I, I, crime. Right. Some charming stuff. So uh, uh, Bernie, um, so there's two things here. This will end, end the first movie. So Bernie um, has his arm on the couch. A woman sits down and she says, a woman says to him, like laughing off his, his uh, groping of her behind, Bernie, you animal, you're insatiable. <laughs> this is one of two incidents, but really the biggest one is that uh, Bernie uh, has sex with Tina. So rape culture is so pervasive that men rape when they're dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there, there is there is no end to our debauchery, apparently. Unbelievable. Well, literally, yeah. If, from beyond yeah, the grave, literally. you can. Uh... Although in in that version, he couldn't say no. It's true. Well, you know, I don't know. I guess <laughs> I, I don't anyway, think I don't think that's going to fly. That argument in twenty twenty one. I believe all women. Okay, so. <laughs> oh, um, <of> <laughs> The um, uh, that was the first movie. Uh, just now, the second movie. Uh, just a, you've already mentioned a quick, quickly, uh, quickly some of the others. So titties popping out on the beach. Um, now this might be my favorite thing in the world. I think. Like, yeah, you know the I mean? way the way you said it made me like it even more. I was just I like, know. titties popping out on the beach. Like, my favorite thing, thing in the world is titties, titties popping, popping out on the beach. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it does give the film an immediate eight out of ten. So it, there's there's that. <laughs> Larry the sex pest. Basically, what the? I have a question about that. What the fuck was the date like? She comes back from the date with Larry. She like 
despise it. What the hell did yes. he do on this day? Yeah, yeah. It's never just me, is it? That was it's annoying that- me. Yeah, he like I, we know at this point he's the worst, but you think they would kind of at least give us a hint of him being the worst? It's just like it goes. I've never seen a scene like it before where they go straight to the end of the date, and she's like, "All right, you're the worst person. I want you to leave." But then instead of de- dealing with the date, we just deal with him trying to sexually abuse her afterwards. It's a very strange approach, mm. if truth be told. Oh, he definitely asked her to pay for the meal, didn't he? Like he had to. <laughs> 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 but I think that makes it worse because you, you you know it's it's what you don't see that you know it's mm. your own imagination that mm. that's coming up with the worst stuff you know yeah and she seems so reasonable doesn't she like he goes and let's be clear like right from the off he's a bit of a slime ball and w- when he asks her out on a date he even he's, he's surprised that she says yes so <laughs> yeah. the, in, the immediate impression is that she has a pretty high tolerance for sleaze. But one date later, she's like, I cannot deal with this guy. He is <laughs> the worst. I, I want to see what happened on that date. Mm. So the last thing I mentioned for this particular movie, get your ideas on, on the Me Too scale itself. Uh, the L. Ron Hubbard C-Sex crew that they mm. assemble at the end of the film <laughs> yep. puts this um, in another realm entirely. Because really th- that does. is just like the movie is pretty much over. And then they just go, anyway, with this million dollars that we've got, here are these nubile women. They, they don't. They're probably not sailors. They, let's face it. They're prostitutes. I, I don't <laughs> think. They. <laughs> well, they just want to be on a boat. Yeah, they're, they're very, very clearly prostitutes with hats. And that is all they are. Okay, that we see crashed what as soon we want as they left the uh, port. Honestly. <laughs> all right. So now these are the charges, gentlemen and ladies. What What do we think of this out of ten? On a me too scale. Now we've said that, you know, zero, no case to answer, and ten is 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 you know getting getting serious. Well, the first film I think is a very different beast. I think there, there are some you know there are some light shenanigans. Uh, again, uh, maybe some people disagree, but I'm like four, five, maybe for the first film. I think the date scene alone pushes this one up much higher on the scale. <laughs> and then and then for the final shot of the film to sensibly saying. This is the American dream. Because that's what this series is really all about, these two films. And at the end of it, they say, that the guy's finally got the money. So, of course, they get their yacht and their prostitutes, just like any good American would want. Yeah. So, I, I don't know. Well, the, I'm not sure if that flies. The, the, ultimate, the ultimate message is that, you know, you, you lie, cheat, break the law, steal, defraud, and, and look what you get at the end of it. The Donald. M- money and hose. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Boats and hose. <laughs> boats, yeah. boats and hose, don't they? Well, there's a, as a wise man once said, they they let you grab them by the pussy. <laughs> oh, of course. Of course. I believe wow. it was said by the president, 45th president of the United States. Maybe he was talking about seahorse. I mean, you know, anything goes with sea. It's a very different rule set to uh, the no, main I one, think that's for sure. number two definitely pushes the, the Me Too scale higher. But I it's because of Richard. For me, wow! Uh, it, that, like I said, it, he's all about doing business until something happens that he can push himself onto a woman, like the conga thing. He has to run out of the uh, the room when he hears about look at the titties on that or the tits or whatever he said on. Uh, <laughs> just everything about that. like it's just so lecherous. It is awful with that guy. Yes. And even at the end, he's going to call the police until the yes. birds come on. Yeah. Yes, until thank he you, exactly. Birds. It's like, okay, until I realise I can hire myself some women with some money that I didn't want to keep anyway. Okay, so I'm in. In some ways, he is worse than Larry. Because at least Larry is honest with what he is. Yeah. Yeah. But I just out of interest, this is going slightly... But so what, what was the deal with him and in uh, Claudia? Like, I, I felt like they were implying at some point that there was going to be some kind of relationship between them, but it just never really materialised. It was so realistic. They just went their separate way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's right. <laughs> like she spent like half a day with him. It's like, well, I, I'm kind of glad he's not dead, but Jesus Christ, this guy is the worst. Gwen from the first, was it Gwen from the first film? Where Weekend of Bernie's 2 is set like two days later and they don't even mm-hmm. mention the woman that he's <laughs> yeah. having a life with. Mm-hmm. So it's actually, a, it's actually a series trope, is yeah. that you spend time with the woman for the whole movie and then you just don't kick it no more. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so me too scale for the second one's pretty high. Are we all agreeing mm. yeah, on that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think you oh. you all are 
playing this out. I I think this movie is so egregious that I've contacted Hermione Granger to give a speech at the UN <laughs> <laughs> about what pigs uh, we all are for even watching it. Okay, so you're giving it a, a eleven. Is that it's what you're big. giving it? It's big. I'm just, I look, I'm just saying it's big. And I'm, um, and, but unfortunately, I had a great time as well. <laughs> so, well, as you know, as you know, quite often the, the higher the Me Too scale, you know, the, the higher the fun. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there, there, I, there's one thing we may disagree on the ultimate score, but we can all agree that, you know, sexually <laughs> questionable scenes are enjoyable. It's just, your words, I, you well, said it. Yeah, I wondered where you were going with that then, honestly. I, didn't know you were going with that. I wasn't sure either, to be honest. No, it was a big pause. It was after you said sexually. And it's just yeah, that yeah. big, like, pregnant pause. Yeah, I feel like, you know, like, you know, you're going down a street and you're like, you're fully aware that you're painting yourself into a corner. It's like, oh, man, <laughs> <laughs> this could go very wrong for me. And I feel like it did. But yeah, I, I can assure you, it could have gone a lot worse. I, I just, look, I must say, though, I watching even the first one, but particularly the second one, I just it just makes me want to get um you know, these interns at, at the New York Times and, you know, people who work at Penguin Publishing and just and I just sit them down and put the clockwork orange, um, you know, eyeball <laughs> things on and just say, check out this mo- little movie that I've got for you. <laughs> and just to, just to show them that how the world, I don't know, well, could be really if, they wa- if we all wanted it to be. <laughs> Again. <laughs> People ask you, it's like, wait, you're going straight to the sequel? Yeah, don't worry about the first one. It's just going to be Weekend at Bernie's 2. Hey, you know, they actually wrote a script for Weekend at Bernie's 3 that never got made. Yeah. So it exists out there. Apparently you can read it online. It's it's out there. Do you have any idea how they get Bernie back again? No, no idea. But but I think there's a there's a female body is an addition maybe <laughs> oh, so, so they go so they go terminator 3 is it terminator 3 where they have the the female yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not, i just love it actually that if if you were to make this movie now that would be the first thing they'd say anyway they they get helen mirren or something to be the <laughs> but, you know? but but you you, you couldn't and it do- would be melissa mccarthy and Kristen wig or whatever would yeah. be the, the two that you know and, and, and it would be and and everyone would say oh this is so much better no but there's no there's no way you could do that though like to have to have a guy like go up into the bedroom and and sleep with a dead helen mirren would be why not why not <laughs> would it's, it's be... a different film for sure yeah <laughs> i can't believe you said helen mirren <laughs> <laughs> not helen not sweet helen do you see what Body. the tagline for weekend of bernie's three was <sighs> The corpse awakens. So I think they <laughs> are bringing Bernie back, apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, shit. But that is the thing. They have opened the door with this film. I mean, you know, by uh, introducing, uh, you know, voodoo magic, it's like, well, you know, anything goes at this point. Hmm. Oh, uh, goodness me. It's, uh, it, it, yeah, I don't know. Well, I, 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 I await with bated breath the uh, Weekend at Bernie's <laughs> 3 or the soft reboot, you yeah. know, whatever that is. Yeah, but are we going to have Andrew McCarthy back? Is he going to be just playing this in his, like, late 50s but still just Probably. being his actress and horrible uh, as well? Andrew McCarthy has to be Bernie at that Yeah, point, that's what I was going to say. He should come back as Bernie. Great job. That is a good job. He's coming back for a paycheck. But that'd be so nightmarish, though. Like, like in, you know, it'd actually make it quite brilliant. It'd be like six feet under or something. Like how everyone <laughs> dies. Like, like it's sort of like, you know, like oh yeah, it's isn't it funny that like Larry's dead now, and you say yeah, but I, I like spent, spent a lot of time with Larry, and I thought he was like funny and full of life, and now I've got to hang out with him like dead. It's kind of, <laughs> kind of a bit the only thing is like it would like you wouldn't even have to do a build up. Like if you've seen the other films, and the film just opens with Larry dead, he's been shot, and you're like, well, yeah, of course he has. Of he got he shot has. by he got shot by all the women he's um you know abused. <laughs> yeah. I'm Larry. Fuck off, Larry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good line. Great, Great line. line. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, any uh, other tidbits from this uh, on either film really? To cover? There was one thing I wanted to mention about this one was in the bank when they they got Bernie between <laughs> them and they got the uh, the Mac. Which, why are they selling Macs in a paradise? I don't know. But they managed to find a Mac. And Bernie's signing the paper with his left hand 
from his yes. right hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> no, I, no, I like that. That was that. good. He's got That's two good. left hands. It's great. <laughs> But all the stuff. I think one of the joys of the film is the is the ingenious ways in which they try and animate Bernie. So tie, you know, shoelaces tying to his, you know, shoes, yeah, yeah. or you know, doing your yeah, hand puppetry, or or like yeah, pull ropes and pulleys, <laughs> <You know? laughs> all of that. In the morning on weekend, the Bernie's one when he's waving to the passersby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his limp wristed wave. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, again, I, I guess one of the questions is, I was like, by the end of the film, I'm still looking at it. I was like, despite the spear in his head, which, again, is a whole other question, is why does Larry have a spear gun with him for this endeavour? I have no idea. <laughs> that, like, yeah. I thought about that. I was like, why yeah. do they have that? Yeah. Even, like, decomposition aside, I mean, he is driven through, what, four, five gates, numerous buildings. He seems in pretty good nick again at the end, you know? <laughs> He seems to be doing surprisingly well for a guy who at this point has been dead for weeks, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Well, if it, the movie would be so different if they treated him like the, the you know, the, the the apparitions in American Werewolf in London. Like it was like, <laughs> like just getting more and more horrendous and you just go, oh, my God. Like the movie only works like because he's it's completely bloodless. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like, yeah, of course, like, yeah, yeah. There's no blood. Like he gets shot, and and you know, I, I don't know how the body works, but there's like z- literally no no blood <laughs> at all. Like like it's <laughs> he's sort of just death is death is just such a a lark. It's like oh yeah, you just oh, play, this playing is fun. dead. You know? <laughs> also, Walkman's underwater. Yeah, yeah. It's not flying. It's no. not flying. Yeah, yeah. and I, I I've got like a special place in my heart for people in films who have really small roles who were so truly terrible that they stand out like a sore thumb. And the security guard who comes out and says, freeze, he has one line, one li- <laughs> and not one line, one word. And somehow he, <laughs> oh, it's just the worst delivery I've ever seen. I was like, you could have gone out and got somebody from the street who could have done a better job than that security guard. But no, we're going to stick with this. That was take 20, and that's the best one we've got. It's unreal. I, I did love the, uh, the scale of what they deemed as more uh, offensive for law. Sorry, my words are not coming out right. Like, he was caught shoplift in the investigator, and he had four coppers put him in the car. But when he assaulted, apparently assaulted women by ripping their bras off, one copper. Yeah. <laughs> Fun and games. That, that's, that's just, you know. Um, that's how things matron. go on the Virgin Isles. Yeah. That's just. Schemes. You know. Like it would no, because it was all agreed by the male crew, the male <laughs> producer, the male writers that like it was just yeah, carry on Virgin Islands. Yeah, like, yeah. They weren't even going to arrest him at first. So like, well, it seems pretty pretty standards, you know, to me. I don't know what to, I don't know what the guy's done wrong, truth be told. But <laughs> I again it's the whole thing, isn't it? It was like like the Arthur like story is a bizarre one. Then there's the whole, like you said earlier, the um oh, what are they called? The two guys, Henry and Charles. I'm like, I'm still not totally sure if they're required in this movie at all. And it, I think it's amazing that we've talked about uh, Weekend and Bernie's too so much, and we've hardly mentioned how mental the whole voodoo thing is. Like, I know we've used it as an excuse to get him up and about, but, I mean, it really is insane. And I, I don't think it paints uh, the Virgin Isles in the, the finest of light, should we say. Because everybody knows about voodoo. But we've talked about this in some other films. I mentioned them earlier. You know, in fact, one of the guys, not Steve James, but the other guy, he's in Mark for Death, <laughs> like another vo- voodoo-inspired film. And um, there was something about the eighties. This, you know, this uh, with Serpent in the Rainbow. This, this, this uh, fascination with this, with this, uh, what, what, what back then was an exotic um, culture. You know, and. Um, you know, uh, uh, if you if you buy into well, I don't know. Like this, these this film is not uh, is not like Serpent in the Rainbow. So it's it ultimately, it's sort of like it, it it's it's well intended because they're trying to have fun, but the the engagement with the culture is is you know they're just using it like like in very interchangeably to get oh, yeah. you know. So you know, it's sort of it's it's sort of indefensible. 
on those grounds in a way like you just go well you know i mean yeah you do have to just kind of go with it it's like claudia they just by just so happen that he hits on her and she just happens to be bang into voodoo and just by chance her dad who's a legitimate doctor is also bang into voodoo it's like okay let's Mm. just let's just go with this i suppose Mm. yeah no it, it is um look so the movie hinges on um, whether you whether you you're into the, the the voodoo dancing or not, and if you're not into it, well, <laughs> exactly. don't watch it. You know, just don't watch it. What came first, movie. the premise or the voodoo dancing? Are they just Probably like, the oh dancing. man, wouldn't it be? I think it was the dancing. I think, yeah. listen, if we can get Bernie to do the dancing, that I will do anything <laughs> to make this work from a narrative perspective. <laughs> anything to get to make sure that he's dancing on the beach. <laughs> As, as Ricky said, because they had the Caribbean music in the first one, they doubled down in this one, and they had to find a way to just keep it going. So why not voodoo dancing with the Caribbean music? But it's an essentializing of the of the of the concept. Again, it's that they distilled it. They were like, you know, let's go to the Virgin Islands. Like, let's not even bother with the hand. Because let's like, you know, and let's just go the full distance. You know, I just, I just feel like that's how this film got. Like that's how I would pitch it. I mean, remember earlier I was talking about my NFL dance. Now imagine that in a boardroom. Nobody really knows. It's like, listen, I just, I just, I walk in, there's suits everywhere. I just lay face down on the floor. Like I said, 20, 30 seconds, all the ass. Finally get up, do the little dance, look at everybody and I say, now imagine that, but I'm dead. Like I'm getting the funding. I'm absolutely getting the funding. That's how these movies get. I assume that's how they get made anyway. Well, I, either way, so I'm, I think we can all agree. Like, like I mean, I don't think it's a very good film, but I'm glad it exists. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that, you know, because it's always better to have, uh, you know, those you know, conservatism, creative conservatism is a real scourge. And this movie has none of that. And I have to applaud that. Oh, absolutely. As we say on our show, usually it may not be a good film, but a great watch. Yeah. I had a great <laughs> yeah, time. That's true. Yeah. Nobody once in the making of this film asked the question, should we be doing this? The, the answer, it was just nothing but green lights across the board. It's like, yeah, we should absolutely do it. Again, it comes back to that idea. It's like, I hope there was a lot of cocaine involved. I have to assume there was. <laughs> there definitely was. <laughs> I think at this point in 2021, if you had directed or been involved in this film and they asked you, was there a lot of cocaine involved in this movie? If there wasn't, you would lie and say there was. Definitely. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if anything, I mean, uh, like heroin, all sorts. All sorts was going on. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Well, I think uh, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Sure. The Weekend at Bernie saga. Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. as it's as it's known amongst us fans. Du- duology <laughs> is the, another word that I've heard used. <laughs> really? Well, let's just hope Weekend at Bernie's <laughs> 3 comes out sometime. We can make it. Awesome. Well, I think that's a great way to wrap up our first international collaboration. Thanks so much, guys, for, uh, yeah, getting together. And uh, I know it's very late over where you guys are. I think it's uh, bedtime for you, but... I um, think it is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the day's just beginning for us. Yeah, yeah, good luck with that. But, um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure, guys. Hopefully, uh, we'll get to do this again soon. Uh, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, uh, if you liked our co-pro, definitely think about checking out uh, Hey You Guys podcast. They do a great job in reviewing movies uh, of the 80s and, and early 90s. All right, well, that was the Hey You Guys podcast in collaboration uh, with The New Flesh. We had a great time. That was a lot of fun. So good. Mm. So what do we have next week? Uh, Next week we have, we're we're doing a film called Jade. Mm, Sexy. AJ, have you seen Jade? No. Oh, I think Frank's uh, going to have a good time. Hey. Definitely, definitely. I think there's a lot lot to talk about. And then... Um, uh, the week after, we're gonna. I think we're starting our spooktacular. I'm really excited mm. about that. <laughs> oh! <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, so good. So um, yeah, that's what's coming up. And uh, mm. but this Thursday, uh, we uh, what are we doing this Thursday? I, I I believe we've got Katie on board to discuss uh, a pyramid scheme, Ooh. a fashion pyramid scheme. Ah, oh, it's fantastic, Docker. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. So, yeah, we'll be talking uh, Lula Row 
but also uh, we've got a few other topics that we might might cover as well. Some tra- just a question: Is there any trans stuff to talk about? Or? Well, there might be a little bit oh, of trans okay. uh, transplaining. <laughs> when is that not? <laughs> just checking. Just checking. I wanted people to. I didn't want people to think that you know they, they weren't going to have their favorite topics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. We're not drifting too far away from the uh, trans anchor here. No. All right. Well, we said what we said. Said what we said. Till next time. Long live the new flesh. Long live the new flesh. Welcome to Side Boob Cinema. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,